Asha, uh, would you uh, would you be so kind as to introduce yourself? So my name is Rabbi Asher Meza. I have a website called TorahJudaism.com. I love having dialogues with other religious people. I also have debates with Muslims, Christians. I'm of the opinion that what's good for me is good for you. I'm sure you guys are of the same opinion. So I like encouraging people to consider Judaism. Can yeah. I be the first to ask you a question? Go ahead. Are you aware of um, Rabbi Tovia Singer? Yes, no, sir. Do you, do you agree with his, um, his opinions? Because I personally, I'm a Muslim. And I'm a, I'm a Sunni Muslim, and I've never heard him say anything that I didn't um, agree with. Uh, I don't agree with his opinion on Islam. On Islam, so you think right? he's, he's too pro-Islam? You're saying his opinion is the one that's generally held nowadays that Islam is considered a monotheistic, non-idolatrous religion. Right. That's the popular opinion made popular by Maimonides. Right. Maimonides lived in 1135 to 1205 of the Common Era. Some say he even converted to Islam to save his life under the Almohads. Maimonides believed that Christianity was idolatry, but he didn't believe that Islam was idolatry. Right. Now, idolatry really has nothing to do with worshipping idols necessarily. You could be an idolater without worshipping idols in Judaism. Just right. because the word for idolatry is Abu Dazara. It doesn't really imply mm. idol worship. In Islam, shirk, which also doesn't necessarily yeah. imply idols, but a partnership of different mm -hmm. gods. So I disagree. I think that from a halachic perspective, halakha is our version of Sharia. Yeah. I think Islam would fall into idolatry. The question is, what part of Islam? Do you accept that there's only one God and we, sh we are basically... Uh, you know, uh, uh, worshiping the same God. I don't think we're worshiping the same God. However, but therefore, you're calling it idolatry because you're saying it's they're no. basically praying no. to a different God, which is an idol, not a real no. God. So there can't be uh, two real gods. Hold on, hold on. You could be a complete monotheist and still be an idolater. Yeah, exactly. Right. So someone could say that a turtle is God. That's the point I'm highlighting. I'm saying, uh -huh. uh, is your belief that Islam is a idolatrous religion based on the simple fact that you're saying it's not the same god so therefore it's it's, it's a fake god therefore it's an idol therefore it's idolatrous correct correct right Just okay because so now i understand your position the way, i don't have anything negative towards muslims no but you're denying that we have the same god absolutely because based the way on, we know based on what do you have any well, evidence for this i'm going to discuss my point based on that'd be good the That'd idea that the way we know what God we worship is by what that God expects from us. So the Jewish God expects different things than the God of the Muslims. And the mm, same goes for the God of the Christians. No, no, no. I don't agree with that. But I'll let you finish your point. Unless we you have a to Torah. Speak. Well, yeah, hold on, hold on. God, God, my, point is this, Rabbi, my point is this. God expects different things from different people. So the covenant that he has with the Jews puts them in a position where they have to observe God and have rituals that are specific to them, which doesn't apply to Muslims as Gentiles. So because God's asking us to do two different things, doesn't mean we have two different gods because there was only one Abraham, but he had two sons, isn't it? Mm -hmm. oh, absolutely. So we come from two different lines. So However, your job as, as Jews is to preserve the law of God, isn't it? That's the Islamic perspective. From the Torah, well, I'm a Muslim, but you can correct right. me. And I'm going to correct you from the Jewish perspective. According cool. to the Torah, God only gives one standard, only one standard. He makes no distinction between a law for a non-Israelite or laws for Israelites. If someone wants to worship the God of Israel, according to the Torah, to the five books of Moses, he has to keep all of God's laws. And again, God made no distinction. I know Islam makes a distinction and even Christianity makes a distinction. But these are offshoots of Judaism. Continue. That's it. Okay, so um, you're basically saying that if we want to um, say that our gods are one, we basically have to observe Judaism. Absolutely, from a Jewish perspective. Right. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand we have different saying. gods, and I could respect you as a person, <clears throat> but we yeah. belong to different religions. For us to say that we worship the same God is to make the Islamic argument that everyone is ultimately a Muslim. Ah, uh, so. You're changing your beliefs to kind of like contradict Islam. Uh, that what Christians do. My they beliefs have a, a, never included Even Islam. though their religion come before Islam, they have to basically refute Islam. So they come up with these new arguments. Which really, that, Islam that more... should stem from a, a purely mm -hmm. Jewish point of view. 
you wouldn't really have that point of view because you're just basically trying to refute something that came later. I think Islam right. is trying to refute really should Judaism. Just stick to your, you should All stick right, to hold your, on, your hold lane, on. Lane, I think Islam is trying to refute Judaism by saying that the Torah is corrupted and we corrupted it. So not the once Torah, that not the, not the Torah itself, the 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 um the Tanakh. All right, hold on, hold on. Um, Khan, I, I'm getting um yeah. Someone's just confirmed what I thought. I was gonna say I'm gonna, I want to open up the discussion a little bit, if that's cool. thank you very much. Yeah. Just because um yeah, I feel like uh there's there's probably a, quite a few angles that um I mean yeah. To be honest, I All think right, you're cool, the first cool, Jewish cool. person. No, I made my. I made my point, so... Um, no, no, no worries, man. You're the first Jewish person we've had on the panel, so there's going to be a lot of... Um, yeah, people are going to be sort of jumping at your throat, so bear with it if you're you're sort of... Uh, you're put on the spot for a moment. But yeah, go through witness. Um, sorry, um, uh, you probably can't remember me. I've been on your channel a few times. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, um, uh, but obviously, because you know a lot of Christians see Jesus as the Messiah. I just wanted you to, if possible, clarify for me. What would be the signs that the Jews would be looking for in the Messiah? The ones that do not see Jesus Christ as the Messiah. What, what, what are those signs that they are waiting for that the Messiah has come for them? Okay. I'm a teacher of Torah. Now, just like Islam, there's other ideas, developed ideas that call itself Islam, just like there's other ideas that call itself Judaism, but it is not Torah based. Now, the notion of the Messiah is a later developed idea. It's really the notion of the king on steroids. In other words, the Torah endorses the notion of a king, but that idea of a king, especially when Israel was in exile, got blown out of proportion to the point that people are now awaiting a king coming in the clouds that will never die. So Christianity and its view of the Messiah was taken out of a second century notion of who they thought the Messiah was gonna be. The Torah doesn't talk about a Messiah, it seems, that Torah revolves around his instructions and us taking those instructions and trying to make the world a better place with them. It has nothing to do with some celestial bailout and some thousand year reign. What does Judaism expect of a Messiah is different than what Torah requires because Torah doesn't mention the notion. So there is no monolithic understanding of what the Messiah is supposed to do or how are we supposed to recognize him. The most popular one is the one put down by Maimonides. Maimonides said that the Messiah that we're waiting for is to resemble Bar Kokhba. So Bar Kokhba was a false Messiah that Rabbi Akiva, a sage of the second temple time, thought was gonna be the Messiah and led a revolt against Rome. After he was killed by the Romans, he came to a conclusion that he couldn't have been the Messiah because he failed in his mission. So ultimately the consensus is that he would be a great military leader. Now, if you go into more Kabbalistic streams of Judaism, that Messiah starts to resemble Jesus more. A superhuman, someone who doesn't die, someone who in some way even has a throne next to God. So there is no monolithic understanding of the Messiah, but I don't blame Christians for going so far off the notion because they basically ran with Jewish folklore and legend on the issue and you know connected the dots and realized that if this guy is such a superhuman, he's probably God himself. Thanks very much. Yeah. <laughs> Silence. Well, I mean, I could make it controversial by then asking what are your views on Zionism, but I'm not going to go there. Well, I don't think that's that go controversial. There. I mean, people in the chat, people yeah. are saying that I should get a Hebrew. Oh, what are your views on Zionism? I so the vast people majority saying, people so are saying I should get Orthodox Jews. Carry on. Carry on, man. No worries. The vast majority of Orthodox Jews are what's called non-Zionists. They're not necessarily anti-Zionists, but they're non-Zionists. Now, there are a handful of Jews that appear in a group called Natura Karta that are the ones that we see protesting alongside Palestinians. That's a small, small group of Jews that are anti-Zionist. So I fall into the non-Zionist camp. I don't endorse the existence of Israel from a biblical Torah perspective, although from a secular perspective, I embrace them as an ally in the war against terror and as a democracy. Fine, but my religion doesn't come into play with that. So Zionism was a movement founded by secular atheistical Jews. It had nothing to do with God. And later on, did they begin to mystify the whole notion and tie it into biblical you know, rights to the land? The truth is the land of Israel doesn't belong to the Jews. The land of Israel belongs to anyone who keeps Torah. And the vast majority of Jews who live in the land of Israel do not keep Torah. Probably around 10% do. It's a secular government. Wow, that's amazing. I'm so glad you said that. Yeah. 
Because it's so strange because years. I mentioned Rabbi Tovia and I've heard Tovia say that um, our gods are the same god. Yeah, he's a Zionist, but you're not. I mean, it's, uh, Correct. It's very strange, but I'm interested. I'm listening. I'd, I'd like to hear more from you. He's a religious Zionist. I'm more of a secular Zionist. Uh, in other words, I believe that Israel has a right to exist, but not on a religious basis. I believe that anyone who fights for that land has a right to keep it if they win. But I think that from a religious perspective, only people who keep Torah are allowed to claim it. Yeah, you're only a Jew if you're observant, isn't it? Correct. Like, yeah, that's right. I agree with that 100%. And that's like my perspective. That like, I was going to ask you, like, because I've heard him talk about things about um, this return to like the messianic kind of like life and like there will be like a temple and blood sacrifices will like is this all like um part of prophecy or is it just his political view or what is it because i've only ever li heard it from him i want to hear from someone part else of the torah. Well. Like, it's part of the, the torah. torah yeah of course it is For but sure. is it like um a prophecy that you're waiting to see fulfilled are we gonna like Has, see it in our life no no it has no? nothing to do with prophecy this is part of a formula. In Torah, the formula is that when Israel begins to stray away from God, God will exile them from the land. And this is what happened 2,000 years ago. And then it says that when Israel repents, God's going to bring them back into the land. However, Israel never repented. Israel forced their way into the land of Israel. And, and this is something that rabbinic Judaism or even Torah Judaism does not tolerate. This is why most Orthodox Jews don't call themselves religious Zionists. While religious Zionists identify... <laughs> with the notion of the Jewish people from a biblical perspective without taking account the tenets of what it takes to enter the land. Well, they don't care. Yeah, yeah. So there's really a war between the Jewish people and people don't know this because it's the only ones that make the news are the more liberal Jews. For example, the Netanyahu is not a religious Jew. He believes differently than I do and the vast majority of Orthodox Jews do. Um, however, we still visit the land. I mean, I lived in Israel for five years. I mean, it's nice to have a kosher restaurant in every corner and a synagogue in every corner. But when it comes to saying prayers for the state of Israel, like we sit down in the synagogue. We don't we don't endorse this government from a religious perspective. Right, I support, right. Like I support India, like I support every other democracy. But uh -huh. That has nothing to do with my religion. I understand that. Can you explain for like a few of the people in the comments who maybe aren't so familiar with actual Judaism and they're only going by like the, the rubbish that they hear, people are asking about this term goyim. Now I'm Turkish, so uh, we have a similar word, bo boiler, which is like goyim, but with a B instead of a G. So it just means to us, it means the tribes or the generations of tribes. So as far as I know, goyim means that, but there is other connotations being attached to this word goyim. So could you explain for, yeah, sure. for the population? So in the Bible, in the Jewish scriptures, goy, which is a singular of goyim, just means nation. As a matter of fact, Israel is also called, it says, it calls them a goy kadosh, a holy nation. Then later on, it got twisted to mean nations outside the covenant, heathens, idolaters. It makes sort of sense. I mean, back then, obviously, like before the rise of Islam, mm -hmm. If you weren't part of the Jewish people, you were an idolater. Your behavior resembled that. Now, after Christianity, after Islam, even the rabbis acknowledge that even though they call that idolatrous as well, it's on a different level. It's idolatry based on Judaism, based on Torah, based on the ethics of Torah. So this is why a Muslim can be ethical. So a basically, can like, be ethical. you have like to make, to make it in layman's terms, that's like, so people can understand. Like obviously, in Judaism, there's like the the laws for the Noahide laws, basically, like the non-Jews. So we can still be righteous without no, I don't actually... believe in that. I don't believe in that. No? that well, the Noahide laws are seven laws developed by the Sanhedrin to adjudicate non-Hebrews or non-Israelites living on Jewish lands. In other words, it's identical with the notion of dhimmi in Islam. In other right. words, if you're an unbeliever, you're allowed to coexist amongst believers if you take upon yourself certain laws which includes that you can't be an idolater you can't curse god uh you can't murder right so yeah yeah yeah. that notion got blown out of proportion through folklore and legend and legends arose that began to teach that six laws were given to adam and the seventh law was given to noah and they created another religion out of it right but this is not the way 
the law brings it down, the halakha brings it down. So ideally, Judaism would want everyone to consider entering the covenant with God and becoming a Jew themselves, because you don't have to be born from a Jewish mother to be Jewish. I mean, it helps. It's just like someone could be born into Islam. But if you connect there, yourself- There is a process of conversion outside right. of that. Sure, sure, absolutely. Right. So the same notion of the Shahada is the same notion of you entering the covenant of God through conversion in Judaism and being counted as a 100% full descendant of Israel and member of Israel. So I think that's the ideal laid down in Torah for humanity. I mean, God only gives one standard. Nowhere in the Torah does God mention seven laws or a set of seven laws. It seems that if Gentiles or idolaters or heathens in Torah want to worship the God of Israel properly, it behooves them to obey the God of Israel because that's how he's worshipped. Right? I mean, worship in Hebrew is avodah, to serve, to work for. So the way you work for God is by keeping his instructions. Say, say that word again. Avodah. So we say ibadet. Arabic is very similar to Hebrew, very similar. Beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's I was going to uh, ask you, Asher, uh, you mentioned uh, you follow the Torah, uh, and I'm assuming you follow it or more so than, um, I forgot in the other stuff, the Tanakh, and there was another book I was going to mention. I was going to ask you about a law in Deuteronomy 22, and wondering if there is any such thing as reformation of laws within the Torah. Because mm -hmm. the, the book of Deuteronomy uh, chapter 22, um, I think it's um, verse uh, 28, it says, if a man happens to meet a virgin who is not pledged to be married, and he rapes her, and they are discovered, he shall pay her father 50 shekels of silver. He must marry the young woman, for he has violated her, and he can never divorce her as long as he lives. Now, mm -hmm. would those laws be implemented in a society that was sticking 100% to the Torah? Or, or is there some form of re reformation that's taking place over the, the years where certain laws like that are not taken seriously? Mm -hmm. The reason they're not taken seriously nowadays is because we don't have a court to enforce them. Similar to the idea that Sharia law also functions through a body of elders and a ruling body, a court, Judaism also requires a ruling body for any of these things to be adjudicated. And this body in the Torah is known as the elders, the great court, the men of the great assembly, ultimately the Sanhedrin. It was a group, as stated in Numbers chapter 11, that God tells Moses to establish a court of 70 elders. And in Deuteronomy chapter 17, he says that if you have in, in any areas of dispute, you have to go up to this court and not to stray from the right or to the left of what this court instructs. So this is why Judaism doesn't put people to death nowadays. We're handicapped from a legal perspective without this court. Now, this court ceased to exist in around the third century of the Common Era. So all the rabbis who exist nowadays only hold the title in a ceremonial fashion. They're not real rabbis. Well, the notion of the rabbi disappeared in the third century of the Common Era. But in 1538 of the Common Era, in Sfat in Israel, they resurrected the notion of a rabbi as a ceremonial concept. You're just like Muslims call their teachers imams and, and bishops for Christians. Jews wanted something to call their teachers, so they call them rabbis. Right? But no one nowadays could adjudicate such a case because they're missing one component. It's called smicha. So smicha was the authority to rule over the Jewish people that God tells Moses in the Torah that he was going to put on the elders. And this was passed down from teacher to student all the way to after the destruction of the second temple. It existed for about a hundred more years and then it disappeared. So we lack that ruling body in Judaism to make such decisions. And that ruling body can never be created again because it's the... Uh... It's going to be a big deal trying to everyone to agree on the right group of elders to become correct. Elders. Correct. Uh, although nowhere in Jewish law does it tell us how to recreate it, the Rambam gives an opinion on how he thinks it should be done. And that's the opinion he gives that everyone would have to come to some agreement that these guys are fit to judge. And by doing so, we could reinstitute the death penalty in Judaism and adjudicate laws that haven't been adjudicated for almost 2,000 years. Yeah. So do you agree with all of these laws? No. There are portions of the Torah that I wish were worded differently. Okay, I accept Torah, but I'm not about to tell you that I understand every law. I understand around 98% of the laws, and because of those laws that I do accept, I tolerate yeah. the ones that are hard for me to process. 
Okay, I have a lot of discussions with atheists, and they always have a handful of laws that I'm sure they're similar arguments that they make against Muslims. A handful of laws to disprove the whole belief system. But if the bulk of what you believe works, why should you throw it away because of two things you don't understand? So then sure. could you say that there are certain parts of religion that can be sort of, I don't know if the word disregarded is right, but sort of put to the side based on the fact that we live in a different time period to no. when these laws were written? No. So then what do you do with the laws that you don't agree with or understand? You still keep them if, if you want to remain in that religion. Now, if these laws were fully unethical, if the Torah was unethical, I would drop my Judaism. I would convert so, to right, Islam so, or Christianity tomorrow okay, so if it made me with, a better person. So I'm glad you said Islam first. <laughs> okay, so let's go with this law of, what was, what was he saying? If, if, a girl, if a woman is raped, that the I'm guy Talking about the her. book of uh, Deuteronomy 22, chapter 22, verses 28 to 30. So not the Torah? Oh, well, yes, so that is right. the Torah. It's one that of the five books. Well, it's the book of Deuteronomy. It it's one of the five books. So you're right. It is Is it, it is the Torah. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So would you agree with that law that a rape, someone that's been raped should marry their rapist? It's not for him to agree with it or not. If it's Torah, no, no, it's no, Torah. No, what I'm saying is that obviously he said that, you know, he, un he doesn't understand all the laws. And then I've said what I've said. He said, well, you know, if there's certain parts of it, then I would have to drop my belief. I'm, I'm sure that, um, was it President I, I Erdogan? Answer, President Erdogan of Turkey brought that same law in recently. Like, I think you have, if you rape a woman, you have to marry her or something like that. Right, so, okay, that's, that's fine. But um, I'm asking him in terms of okay, giving sorry. a Jewish perspective. Sure. Now, but what I'd I did like say is that I'm not... And what I did say is that I'm not going to drop the religion because of two laws that I don't agree with, right? This system, this ethical system is spectacular because of the time that it appeared and is the ethical basis of both Christianity and Islam, right? Now, I'm not saying that I'm able to understand it. I would have to be a brainwashed fool to walk around saying that I accept and can justify every law that appears in my Bible. So you should convert to it too. No nonsense. I agree with the bulk of it, which allows me to in some way tolerate the portions that I don't agree with. Now, if you're telling me, do I agree that a man should rape a woman? Absolutely not. But do I consider no, no, no. unethical? Huh? Do you agree with a woman who's been raped having to marry her rapist or, the, or, or even being given that option, the rapist being given that option? Of you write this woman. Oh, well, that's not the way it's understood her. in Judaism. The woman is not forced to marry the man. She has the option to marry the man, and the man has to pay her dowry and is forbidden from ever divorcing her. But I mean, even in Judaism, you're allowed to even have more than one wife. I mean, just not nowadays, but according to Jewish laws, you're allowed to have four. It's not necessarily how it appears in the text. The way. Tell I them, Rabbi, tell them. So, Khan, what's your understanding me? of this? Because you, you brought up. Yeah, you're allowed to have four wives, isn't it? Standard. No, no, sure, four wives. Four yeah. wives. Okay, so uh, in terms of um, a woman being raped and the man. Basically, he's trying to say that, don't don't rape a woman you don't want to marry. I'm not asking him that. I'm asking you, Khan, because you, you interrupted saying? before and you said, "Well, oh, you Turkish." No, that's fine. I, I don't know if the law got passed if he was allowed to pass it, but he raised it. I think in the um, parliament. And I don't know like, if he had that much of backing to bring it around or not. Like, okay, but as you as a Muslim, what's, yeah. what's your standpoint on that? See, the thing is, you got to understand, like, with religion, it's like, um, it's an objective thing. So, like, basically, if we're, we're saying this is God's law, we might not like it, but we have to accept that it's, the, it's either the lesser of two evils or it's something that's better for the, for the long-term perspective. So there's always, like, aspects of it that you got to look at. So if you're saying, if you rape a woman, you got to marry her and you got to look after her for the rest of her life. Now we would, from our point of view, look at that as that's a negative. Like, why would you even like give any concession to a man who raped a woman? He should be hung, drawn and quartered. Now that's our current position. So when you try to kind of like go back in time and put our current point of view on people that lived 2000 years ago, it doesn't work. Yeah, but that's my point. Then how are, are so what we're saying is certain laws aren't even valid in today's society because we've moved forward. Yeah, that's right. Right, and I think. Yeah, but from a Jewish perspective, 
the woman is not forced to marry the man. She has the option no, to. In terms okay, of rape... So what if, what if the woman turned around and said, I oh, know, I want to kill him. Like, I'm going to kill him. Is she, would, she be, would that be an acceptable thing for her to do? Unfortunately, there is no death penalty in Judaism for rape. Hey, dude, I'm not sure if you remember me. Um, I'm the guy from uh, Muslim Matters. Yes, yes, I remember your accent. <laughs> yeah, from Chicago. Um, so I, I just want to go back um, when we talked last time, because uh, I asked a few other Jewish people, um, are you still claiming that um, Adam, Noah, Abraham, David are not prophets? Correct. Okay, so um, so majority of Jewish people do believe that David, Abraham, Noah were prophets. Mm -hmm. uh, what makes you think they weren't prophets, or what? 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 What do you have that uh, they don't know? What do you know that they don't know? Or so we don't come to conclusions based on a consensus of uneducated people. Right? I'm sure, like in Islam, you have teachers and then you have just spectators. So the notion of a navi predated Torah absolutely, but just like the notion of the priest predated Torah. The notion of the priest took on a different definition after the Torah was given, just like the notion of the prophet took on a different definition after the Torah was given. So a prophet after the Torah was given was someone who was tasked to bring Israel back to Torah. This is why prophets like Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah only arose when Israel was either going into exile or was already in exile. Before the Torah was given, prophet just meant someone who communicated with God. That definition expired. Just like priest, Cohen meant something different to non-Israelites. Like it says, the Kohanim of Baal, the priest of Baal. Now, it uses the same word priest, Cohen, to refer to a priest of Israel. Now, am I going to say that from a Jewish perspective, a Catholic priest fits the role of a Jewish priest? Absolutely not. To a Jew... Abraham is not considered a prophet because the Torah clarified that definition after the Torah was given. To prehistoric men who classified everyone as a Navi, Nabi in Arabic, all these Semitic languages share similar roots to words. So Judaism elevates those words to a different meaning after the Torah was given. So if you ask a Jew from a Jewish perspective, is Abraham a prophet? No, he's not a prophet. But from a non-Israelite, a non-biblically based perspective, you could claim anyone was a prophet, i.e. an oracle, let's say. But this notion of oracle also doesn't exist in Judaism. We have different names for that. Like notions well, of being a medium. Message, right? Well, there's probably a message, what? but the Jews that, are the, the Jews that I've spoken to they do believe that Noah, Abraham were prophets, and they go by Abrahamic faith. So you're saying that you're not, you don't have an Abrahamic faith, but you have a. a no, uh, he, he's, saying, he's saying they have to serve the specific purpose of calling the people back to Torah. Hey, look, I have no doubt that the word Sheikh predated the Islamic uses of the word, but no one's going to walk around saying that a leader of pre-Islamic times was a Sheikh because. These definitions within our religion takes on a different meaning. No, I, after. I, see, I see what you're saying. I see the word you're talking about. I see what you're saying about the word. But I'm talking about the, let's say prophet was used before Moses as well. Would you consider uh, Abraham and Noah prophets if prophet was used before uh, the, the Torah? Yeah, for sure. No, the Torah says it. It says in Genesis that the king Avimelech, the guy who took Abraham's wife, said he was his sister. He says this man is clearly a prophet. Okay. But this yeah, guy is not a religious know. Jew or Muslim giving a testimony of yeah. what's theologically sound. Well, I'm glad you clarified that. Uh -huh. I was clarifying. I'm glad you clarifying that. So now I understand what you mean. Where prophet was said after the Torah was uh, was revealed, not before. So that's why you call everyone after a prophet, not before. But I believe Sorry. that the Islamic notion of the prophet is incorrect with what appears in Torah. In other words, the Islamic notion of prophet is someone who reveals further understanding of God's will, which is why Muslims believe Revelation, that Muhammad who brings is the final prophet, <laughs> final messenger of God to in some way progress our revelation theologically. That's a problem with the Jewish understanding of a prophet because a prophet is only there to bring you back to the Torah, not to add anything new because the Torah itself says, don't add or take away well, he's not just a prophet, but what he's I've a already instructed right? But he's also called the messenger. Right. So it's two well, different words. Different, right? in, in, in Hebrew, the word messenger is the word angel, right? Malach. 
so a messenger is different in Judaism within a navi, which is the word for prophet in in Hebrew. But Islam takes a lot of Jewish concepts and Arabizes them. And the only way to really see those distinctions is by studying Jewish law, Jewish history, and the Torah. Or I have a best friend that's a rabbi who can explain it to you. It's interesting that you don't see Abraham <laughs> yeah, that also, yeah. as a prophet, considering in the book of Genesis chapter 15, you know, Lord says, do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield. And he goes on to talk to, uh, talk to him about how he shall reward him. And then later on within that same chapter, he forges the com covenant with Abraham, telling him about his descendants and mm -hmm. how the covenant shall be between God and the descendants of Abraham. So it's interesting that even though these two major things have taken place, especially in Genesis 15 with Abraham and God, that to you, you still wouldn't classify him. In well, I'll tell you why. It's because having an encounter with God doesn't make you a prophet. And that's why Islam considers basically every biblical character a prophet. And Judaism mm -hmm. has a book of the prophets because the job of the prophet was entailed in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Mm. But so Deuteronomy chapter 18 says, when you begin to emulate the nations that you're about to displace, I will raise up for you a prophet and he will speak my words. And you have to heed his instructions, i.e. to come back to the proper dean or the proper path, right? So this definition of the prophet is different than just anyone who talks to God. If that was true, we'd think like Muslims do that everyone in the Bible was a prophet. Right? True. All right, all right. Fair Agreed. Fair enough. That's uh, the way you see it. Uh, I, I, I talk to God. Does, does that mean I'm a prophet? No. Nope. No, but uh, the conversation that Abraham had with the God was very specific. You're only a prophet if he actually hears you and replies to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I can tick that box. But yeah, I believe right. the prophecy exists today, by the way. Yeah, God don't speak to women, you should know that. Yeah, oh, no. that's what I was just about to say. I'm no, God spoke to Mary, man. Uh... <laughs> or Miriam. I mean, God spoke to Moses' sister. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, Deborah, Deborah also. Yet, guys, there's hope for me yet. <laughs> which which um, one are we talking about? Mary or Miriam? Which spoke Miriam? to both Miriam. of them, man. Spoke to yeah, both. They're both they, they both have the same name. So yeah. there's Miriam, the sister of Moses, and then Miriam, the mother of Jesus, if you're a Christian. Oh, yeah, that's true. Brother, you know, are you, a, are you a rabbi, bro? I'm a rabbi, yeah. Yeah, bro, I'm very nice uh, nice to meet you. My name is Roza, man. I'm just hearing you speaking a lot. I like, like, the way, I like what you're saying. I just want to ask you uh, just a quick question about the law, because a lot of, um, like, I think Orange mentioned it earlier, like, a lot of the laws in the Old Testament, what, what, what consists of the Torah, uh, some of the Islamic laws are, are similar. So... I just wanted to get clarification. So the law, like those laws would have the Jewish community, do, do, would they still follow them today? Or would they say actually some of them need to be reformed? Is it like similar to the Islamic situation where we have different strands or how do you not deal with those kind of more kind of hardcore laws that in today's society would kind of be unacceptable, like stoning, etc. like that? Right. So those laws, we need a court to actually follow because only a court is allowed to put someone to death. And the sacrificial system, the reason we don't offer sacrifices is we don't have a temple. So those two things, the court, not having a court and not having a temple and an altar to sacrifice on, what limits mm. us on what laws we're able to keep. Okay, so that sounds more, that sounds like the, if the conditions are fulfilled, it's the same things that a lot of uh, Muslims uh, talk about. So if the, if the conditions were fulfilled, would it be applied? From an Orthodox perspective, yes. See, this is what I'm trying to... I, 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 there's I, different I, strands I, I, in yeah. Judaism. For example, Reform and Conservative are not religious Jews. You're just like there's... The a liberal text, stream yeah. in, in Islam. I remember once I went to a mosque in Virginia and I was talking to the imam there and he told me that even in Islamic circles, you have liberal Muslims who the women insist to pray next to the men, you know, instead of behind them. So this exists in the Jewish world as well, but they're called reform and conservative Jews. And these Jews, they drive on the Sabbath, they eat pork. They're, they're not, they're not, they're not following. But you know what it is though? I think that the reason that um, Islam or Muslims are picked up on this more than Jews is because Obviously, because of in the contemporary world, you have Muslims, you know, talking about getting this law back and you have certain, uh, you know, you have these extreme groups that are popping up and actually taking land and trying to implement it per se. So I think maybe that's why we're more scrutinized than you lot, because in theory, you lot do believe in it as well. It's just that we're picked up on it more because of of, of some of Muslims actions. Would, that, would you say I'm correct? Correct. Yeah, that's why it's more picked up in it. That's why obviously. But the Jewish difference with the Islamic laws, Christianity is that Islam doesn't require a court that descends all the way back to Moses. In other words, if if courts existed, 
and there have been more radicalized Jews in Israel that have tried to implement these laws, try to kill Christians, you know, because you're not allowed to have idolaters on your land. All these things that we see ISIS doing has a biblical Torah backing to it. I think your, is, your, your, law, your law is even more, if you look at the Torah laws and the biblical, your laws are actually even more, like, in a sense, harsher than our ones. Perhaps. I mean, I don't know the Islamic law. Well, when you say laws, though, wouldn't you, wouldn't Jews feel unhappy with, because you mentioned earlier that you stick mainly to the Torah. Right. Which means you ignore the Talmud. Which no, I, I don't ignore the Talmud. Okay, you follow. Okay, you also follow right. the Talmud. I view the Talmud how you guys view the Hadith. A Talmud, I was reading, you know, I was reading about Talmud the other In day. In other words, it's secondary. It's basically, it's the oral transmission. It's the same thing as us. It's the Hadith system. Correct. And then your scholars write commentaries on it. You have difference of opinion. I'm telling you, it's, it's pretty much it's the, the same exact religion. same thing, man. It's the same thing, bro. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Is it because someone is copying another? Right, it's secondary. Is that why it's the same? Someone's copying the but, other? But, but, but it requires, but it's secondary, but it still holds authority. Right. Wow, it's crazy, man. However, told me I never knew. So we always make a distinction between Torah law and rabbinic law. In other words, anything that the rabbis came up with can't contradict what the Torah initially says. And when I say rabbis, I mean men of the Sanhedrin, this court that ceased to exist in the third century. It's not rabbis of today. So this is why it's it's debated back and forth. But these laws in the Talmud can't change anymore because we don't have another court. But if another court would arise, then they're able to change Talmudic law, i.e. rabbinic law. There's a message in the chat. A colleague said I should ask, oh, can you please ask him about the Talmud, its status in Judaism, and how many people follow it? From what you've been saying the last 20 minutes, you mentioned a court and elders would have to be chosen for that court. But since that has not been done, then would it be right to guess that in the 21st century, the Talmud, the laws there would not be applied? No, because the rulings of this court were written down into a book called the Mishnah. And the commentary to the Mishnah is called Gemara. So Mishnah and Gemara together is what we call Talmud. The rulings in the Talmud are the rulings that go back to Rabbi Kiva, Hillel, all the rabbis from the Second Temple time and before, Ezra. So these guys were the men of the Sanhedrin. So this is why these laws are still applicable until there's another Sanhedrin that overrides these laws. Oh, and how will that process come about to override those laws? I don't, well, any court of greater number and greater wisdom, this is the words that appear in the Talmud, could override these laws. But the question is, how do you start this court again? Because the line of transmission was broken. It was going all the way back from teacher to student, going all the way back to Moses. So we don't know how to start this again. But that's not the problem we have in Judaism. We have enough laws to keep us ethical and progressing in a godly manner. The thing is, people don't keep those laws. So what's the point of creating new laws if people don't keep the old laws? So, uh, bro, it's, it's, you know you know one thing about the Talmud, like, is there, there's the rabbis that write the commentary and stuff, but... The, 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 the laws in the Talmud that are actually from an oral tradition from Moses, those laws, those laws are solid, right? You can't, you can't dispute those ones that have come from Moses. There's a debate. I'm not of any belief that anything was given to Moses on Mount Sinai outside of the instructions in the five books of Moses. I believe that all the laws in the Talmud were developed by this court, invented by this court. But it doesn't matter whether you believe that Moses received them on the mountain or the court invented them. The Torah still tells you to listen to the court. Because these laws only exist to us because they came to us through this court. But they appear in the writings of the Sanhedrin. So this is why we're obligated to follow it. Not because there's a legend that arose that these laws were given on Mount Sinai. Right? So um, I'm so not going to either, that the either, way, either way you go. Either, either way you go, you still have to follow it. Regardless. Like, Correct. I get what you're trying to say in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But your thing's interesting, man. The Jewish things, the Talmud things, it's, um, it's mad well, interesting. But you guys man. are welcome to convert to Judaism. <laughs> no, I can't, man. My mom's not Jew. <laughs> I, I, no, no. I don't. Like, you don't need a Jewish mother to convert to Judaism. Oh, I, I, mean, I just you, that, explain that to me. Go on. If you had a Jewish mother, you wouldn't have to convert. I heard I was speaking to a Muslim and he told me that we have a similar concept in Islam that if you grew up Muslim from a Muslim family, like you don't have to say the Shahada. Right? Yeah. So it's it's the same thing in Judaism. But if you want to enter the nation of Israel, you have to go through a formal conversion process. And heck, if you wanted to, like, you could even live in Al-Quds because you get free citizenship in the land of Israel. So there's... I wanted to ask that part, you, That's not true. Sorry, sorry, bro. Go on. Oh, sorry. I just mm -hmm. wanted to ask you. This is probably a short question. Um, just two questions. Can you please tell me why certain Jewish women shave their hair and wear a wig? And <laughs> why is it that uh, the certain Jews wear, like, the you know, the black hat and the black... Um, right coats because i know back in the time of moses they weren't dressing like that so what happened that suddenly made certain jews decide we're going to wear this black 
form of clothing. Uh, and for the same reason that you have Muslims wearing dresses and you know, spinning in dervishes, you guys call Sufi. It's a mystical branch of Judaism called Hasidut, Hasidic Judaism, that arose in Europe around 300, 400 years ago that um, basically took all the legal precepts of Judaism and gave them a mystical spin. And that we have an obligation, at least women do, to cover their hair in Judaism. As a matter of fact, we also have an obligation that women must cover their necks, and they don't do that either. Like the Rambam says that the true head covering is the hijab. Your, law, your, laws are, are, your laws are so similar to ours, man. For sure. Also, Judaism teaches that men are supposed to prostrate, but just like Muslims do. And Muslims actually took it from the Jews. Islam came out of Judaism. This is why wearing a hijab was originally Jewish. It appears in books that predated the Quran. But Jews in Europe changed it, and they weren't allowed to. But they did. I don't know how. Wow. Um, also, no, prostrating. Um, yeah, yeah, go on. Like, Jews actually used to pray five times a day, not three times a day. But wow. But it's really done the same way today, but we lump it into three sets. And I know in Islam also, like, you guys take the five times of prayer and then lump them, you know, like, two prayers at a time or three prayers at a time. So yeah. in Judaism, we have shacharit, mincha, and arvit. Like, it's similar to your maghrib. But, uh... We have different. If I knew like a religious Jewish person like you, we would probably get along a lot, man. Like it's just we don't meet a lot of religious ones. Do you get it? No, I hear. Because they kind of keep you. themselves distant. They keep they keep themselves distinct. They don't really mix like that. I don't get along with all Orthodox Jews because I believe in proselytizing. Most Orthodox Jews, although they'll accept you into the religion if you convert, they don't not believe really in encouraging <laughs> people to convert. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. You know, so I believe in encouraging people to convert and encouraging Muslims to consider becoming Jewish. You know, for everyone who converted to Islam out there, that when you're looking for an ethical path to adhere yourself to, you must have came yeah. to the understanding that Judaism predated Islam and predated Christianity. In other True, words, 100%. Judaism and Islam only differ on ceremony and narrative. True. There's no there's no ethics that are improved on in the Quran that don't originally appear in the Torah. Yeah, it, yeah. Even Muslims believe that the portions of the Torah that were corrupted by Jews are portions dealing with narrative. If Abraham sacrificed <clears throat> Isaac or Ishmael, I mean, it's not a law. I mean, Jews don't teach that mm. you could rape on Tuesday and, and steal on Wednesday. The laws are the same. The ethical laws are the same. So if you're looking for a proper path, it would behoove you to go with what's older if it's just as ethical, especially oh, knowing that, just that the later religion was an offshoot of that original religion. So this is why I think that it would behoove all you guys to become Jewish. And you really wouldn't have to change much because almost <laughs> everything Muslims do is like from the, the Torah. <laughs> Actually, he's saying something that's uh, like, uh, as a Christian, I find it sounds like uh, we'll see, but it sounds like he's speaking from a place of honor. It doesn't sound like he's trolling or some type of. No, he's not. He's not. Yeah, he's been very intellectual about it. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. 